Excellent. All right. Everyone, welcome to uh, the uh, Entrepreneurship at the University of Denver Speaker Series. We have an awesome speaker and interviewer tonight, uh, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, before we get started, just a couple uh, small housekeeping items. Up on the screen, uh, all, a lot of you are going to start registering for uh, classes, I think either uh, tomorrow or starting early next week. These are the fall sprints. These are one day, one topic, one credit classes that are open to every student at the University of Denver. There are no prerequisites to take these classes. You'll see them under the EVM designation. So take a look at them and see if there's anything that you are interested in taking. Tomorrow we have in person on campus in the Daniels College of Business and the Marcus Commons, an IP workshop. It's an intellectual property workshop with Jesse Pellin. And she's going to talk about trademarks, patents, copyright. So it's really important. This is a really interesting opportunity for a lot of our students to learn about what they should patent, what they shouldn't, what they should make open source, allow for, the, for, um, for everybody to have access to, and really how to think about creating intellectual property. So uh, if you're interested, uh, I'll, when, I, when I'm done, I'll also uh, drop the uh, event uh, link into the chat. So if you have a chance, it is in person, and I know I have to keep stressing that because we're not used to that as much anymore, but that'll be changing. Okay. So um, I'd like to introduce a friend of mine for over 30 years. Uh, Jasper and I uh, attended the University of Colorado together. He is from Anchorage, Alaska. And there's a number of stories I could tell about Jasper in Anchorage, Alaska, but I will, uh, I will keep my remarks brief tonight. Jasper is one of the uh, founders of Futuristic Films. Um, and I'm really excited to, uh, for him to share his story tonight. And most important, I'm really uh, happy that uh, Sheila was uh, Schroeder um, was willing to do this interview tonight. Sheila is much more competent, and much more well versed in this topic. She's a filmmaker, activist, and a filmmaker educator. She's a professor in media, film, and journalism studies at the University of Denver. So, um, what I'll do now is I will turn it over to Sheila and Jasper. So, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks so much, Joshua. I uh, want to mention that if you have questions at any point during uh, during this talk, our conversation, um, feel free to put those in the chat. Um, Joshua is going to be monitoring that for us and will kind of call on you as um, the conversation sort of winds its way. And I like to take those questions uh, during the conversation itself because you know, if you think of something and then we move on to another topic, sometimes it isn't as relevant. So let's keep those uh, questions coming and uh, we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. I've got a list of questions. Um, it's, it's absolutely great um, to have you here, Jasper. Um, and I, I also want to thank the entrepreneurship program for including me in this, um, uh, this conversation. Um, it's not every day I get a chance to talk to um, one of Denver's um, uh, outstanding creatives. Uh, the way I became uh, aware of Futuristic is through um, some of our interns who have uh, worked for Futuristic and then have uh, then been hired there. So uh, Futuristic has several uh, DU alumni, both on the business and the creative end. So Jasper, I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, during this uh, opportunity to find out a little bit more about um, how this creative business works and how you became, um, I think the title was the unexpected uh, entrepreneur. So accidental, um, yeah. But, accidental, but, both, yes. but, but both are accurate. Yes. So let's start because um, our, our, our audience today might not understand what your business model is at Futuristic. So could you kind of take us through um, kind of start to finish how a project comes in and how you um, as one of the partners, as a director in the company, how that, that uh, project kind of funnels through just so we have that kind of global perspective uh, as to what you do. Yeah, I think that's a great way to start, um, Sheila. You know, I know that for us, production company is just a word we throw around, but, you know, um, it, it probably needs a little bit more explanation. I mean, at the very basic level, 
Futuristic Films is a commercial production company, which essentially means we produce, edit, create content for money. Um, so, you know, in addition to like a lot of our passion projects and some long form documentaries that, you know, may or, or may not be profitable, we typically do a lot of um, um, commercials, like both television and, and web, um, working with ad agencies and brands. And um, we do a lot of short form docs and, you know, what has been kind of termed as branded content. Like those three things are kind of like our bread and butter. Um, in addition to that, you know, like definitely a lot of passion projects um, for personal causes. We, you know, we've dabbled in, in music videos. Um, in During the pandemic, we were lucky enough to kind of work on some concert films and uh, and live streams and, um, and interactive um, kind of projects as well. Um, so we, we do, like, you know, I'd say anything that's kind of uh, creative video content or, or even, you know, content that's part of an interactive um, piece, we do. But I would say that our, from a business standpoint, um, the, the basically the soup to nuts um, video production of, um, of, of commercials and short form docs is kind of like where our bread and butter happens and what we kind of drive drives our business model. Um, I, I would say that the thing that's maybe like now is sort of that, you know, it, video production is, it's very democratized, right? I mean, people can produce high quality video on their phones, edit on their phones, perhaps. Um, I think, you know, where we try to find our, our little kind of niche is um, it, it's, it's typically director driven content, which means that, you know, not only are we just kind of getting paid to do it, but, but it's really it's it's at a level where like the personality of a director, the vision or particular point of view, um, little like like areas of polish are really important to the to the project, um, and that really kind of you know informs every part of our business model, both as a business and also kind of in production and post, you know from the producers and and um, directors of photography and editors et cetera, you know we kind of think of ourselves as a as a boutique, you know kind of like we don't. It, you know, want to be huge. We like kind of like the size we're at, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, so I think that kind of like like sums us up. You know, I think now it's important to to not only you know say that we do video content, we produce it, but it's 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 pretty specific like our approach. Um, you know, typically if, if people are looking for just something that's very very you know inexpensive, the, the most inexpensive way to kind of get their message out that might be going out on on social media. You know, we're probably not a good fit. But, um, but we try to like look at typically that our projects are going to have a little bit of money um, in terms of like the media buy behind them where people probably need to be a little bit more specific in terms of standing out or kind of hitting like, you know, really important um, nuances in their messaging. Um, and so that's kind of where we fit in. Um, and so we, you know, we've got to work with some like, you know, it's top Denver ad agencies and some top national and regional ad agencies across the country. And also like, you know, a lot of brands um, you know, that we're all familiar with that, um, that, you know, kind of have a more of an exciting message maybe to, to share. So, so talk a little bit about how that works. Does a, uh, an agency come to you and say, okay, we want a treatment. Here's the messaging, um, creatively, you know, you have this stable of directors walk us through that process. So we understand that a little, and then I'm going to jump a little back and talk a little bit, have you talk a little bit about how you got into filmmaking itself. Absolutely. I would say just to talk the, the two main things from like, um, you know, outside of the passion projects and maybe like longer term documentaries that, that in terms of the business, you know, we do a lot of commercials with um, ad agencies mm -hmm. and we do a lot of kind of direct um, director brand video work. And it's slightly different how we kind of integrate with, with, with both of those, with those two main clients with, with ad agencies. I think they, they, typically have like a storyboard that's already been approved, you know, by their client, you know, a lot of work has kind of gone into it. Um, they're looking at our roster of directors, kind of trying to see if there's someone that can maybe add a little bit of a, you know, like a exciting spin to it or someone that, you know, they, they feel, you know, will, will effectively bring that message to, to life. Um, so they'll look at, look at our list or we'll kind of put a few people out, sort of share some work back and forth, see if there's a good fit. And then uh, it's sort of typical that, that those, um, kind of customers would kind of like bid out three different companies. It's kind of the magic number. Um, in which case, we'll have a creative call. Um, hopefully, that goes well. And then, and then typically a pretty involved treatment, which is a you know like a proposal. You're talking about how you would you know take like this this storyboard and and bring it to life. You know what kind of aesthetic you think are are important. And then that goes along with a pretty detailed bid. You know. Um, Typically, like on the low end of a, of a commercial, it's around, you know, I mean, very, very low end um, would be like around 50,000. And then they kind of go up 
for us, you know, for like a full campaign, maybe of like three, three spots, like we did for UC health to around like the four, four fifty, you know, just under half a million for, um, for, for like that, that amount of content, you know, and, uh, additional stuff. So they take it super, super seriously. And, and even though they're only, you know, 30 seconds or 60 seconds, it's something that we, you know, we really enjoy you know, taking that seriously. And, uh, you know, it, it's funny we say that, you know, it, it, we're not saving lives, but, you know, it, it sure feels like that way in terms of like how seriously we take all of these things. And then um, with a brand, it might be a little bit different, whereas, you know, they, they'll kind of come to us more for the, the creative, you know, um, to kind of typically they won't have a storyboard. They'll just sort of have like, here's our need as a brand. You know, you, you know, we'll get a sense of kind of who they are through either their other marketing materials or through our own research. And, um, and often that'll kind of be around a, a short documentary or a story. Um, and we'll kind of like work more with them like over a longer period of time to kind of build out kind of like the full creative. But it is amazing, I would say like how much, you know, of a difference between even like a locked storyboard from an ad agency to, um, to like how, what we actually shoot. Um, you know, just um, I, I think you know, people like sort of think it's like, you know, we don't do any of the creative work, but actually there's like a lot of um, whether it's budgetary or what you can or can't do. But typically, I think it's about like, you know, we are experts in in telling stories through the visual medium of, of, of film and TV. And um, and even the, the best intentioned storyboards kind of need that point of view to get effectively produced and finished. Now, storytellers are not made overnight, um, right? And we talked a little bit uh, uh, last week about kind of your journey to where you find yourself now. And I thought that was especially sort of getting on sets early in your career. Talk a little bit about kind of that back to Anchorage and then uh, see you uh, adventure that, that, that took you here to Denver. Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of fits in with this sort of like, you know, idea of being like an accidental entrepreneur. I mean, one thing that you learn as a, I think it was maybe unique in filmmaking at one point is the idea of being a freelancer. Um, now, I think it's kind of like ubiquitous, like, a, like a, you know, across a bunch of industries. Um, but, um, you know, I, I started out, I was in school, like, you know, not necessarily knowing what direction I wanted to, to go. You know, had some interest in engineering, had some interest in, in different sort of like photography. And um, I was just like asked by a friend of my father's if I wanted to go to work with him one day over the summer. And, and he was working on a like a really cool um, commercial set in, uh, in Anchorage, uh, just outside of Anchorage, where this British company had come over to shoot like I think a Kellogg's Corn Flakes commercial. But they were, you know, they built a set in this hangar. Um, they were flying to the glacier to, you know, get shots of, of the glacier and, you know, dropping cornflakes out of planes with like, little parachutes. Um, and I was just kind of like struck by it. Um, I think I, I mentioned to you when we chatted the other day, I was, I was also impressed by the, the snack table that they had and, and, uh, and all the amenities there and, and, you know, all these different people. I think the thing that really kind of stuck with me, though, is just like a bunch of different people. Um, you know, from all walks of life, all kind of providing different skills, all kind of working together for this like common goal. And, um, and I think that, you know, magical day where I just, you know, just kind of got a chance to go and, and the, you know, the, from a kid growing up in Alaska, um, you know, I didn't really think that film sets were something that really existed, you know, or a place where I, I could go. So like that um, access was hugely important, but I just instantly felt at home. I instantly felt, you know, like, mesmerized by what was going on and, and I'm just like I need to find a way to make myself useful here right so I can stay so they don't kick me off and this um, lovely woman who was a amazing props person who'd worked in movies for, for years and, and ended up uh, like um, you know sort of living in, in Alaska somehow um, she said hey do you need something to do and I said yes and she said what we need you to do this is super important is we need you to look at all these boxes of cornflakes and find the best ones and then you're going to put them in the bowl and like this is the cornflakes that you know that are going to be on camera the hero cornflakes as we say in the business and uh and you know while it seemed like a menial task i i took to it like you know because i just wanted to stay for lunch and um you know and i i really have kind of been in and out of sets ever since and 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 the attitude i had that day and also i think just like the the really the the straight up love i had for being on set and, and being a small part of that team then and now leading it now is has uh, you know allowed me um to kind of keep going um so that's how i i guess i guess my first experience um then i got to go back to see you 
Um, there was a great film school there. I, I went to film school there, um, came out with more of an experimental degree, but I kept working on set. So I was always able to kind of build like that business experience kind of while I was like learning kind of the art of filmmaking. While a lot of my sort of, I would say, you know, friends from school sort of had a bit of a tough transition kind of coming from like the academic sort of, you know, everyone's an artist to, to sort of like the hard knuckle sort of set where, you know, where it was more about getting things done. Like, I think that having that balance from early on really helped me. Um, and, and so I kind of went right from school into, you know, the low, lowest levels of the film production, but still like as, you know, a young professional, um, I started out going to going into the camera department when we were still loading, loading film. I was a film loader. I did the slate. Eventually I, they let me near the camera to, to sort of be the focus puller. And I, and I ended up shooting and, and then directing. Um, and that whole time, you know, as we're talking about freelancing, it's like you're, you know, as a freelance person, you are sort of an individual business. You know, everyone was sort of like, you know, forced to like learn, you know, how to do your taxes, um, how to make sure you pay your taxes because, you know, they, they don't, they weren't taking out that, that money as if you had a regular job, you know, that was a surprise at the end of the year. Um, and you really kind of had to hustle um, to get yourself work to sort of balance your schedule. Um, all those things. So I, I think it was, um, you know, when we start when we start to talk about about you know, the business and when we started Futuristic, I think it was really important for me, knowing really nothing about business, but having an opportunity to kind of like learn and make mistakes when it was really, even though I didn't know it at the time, like running a business of one. Um, and I think that that those lessons you learned as a freelancer are important for anyone going into um, you know, filmmaking, definitely, but really any kind of like, you know, media um, and, and really in, in industries that, you know, that I'm surprised almost that there's a lot of freelance in these days. But um, I think it, it is really, really important um, that you, you do treat yourself as a business, um, even if you're just an individual. Well, there's, there's, so, it seems like there's so many transferable sort of skills from, you know, being in that team atmosphere on a film set and then being, you know, a partner in a company. Can you talk a little bit about um, those synergies? Yeah, I, and absolutely. I mean, I think that, that's, that's dead on. I think that, you know, particularly when we first started Futuristic, all of our lessons had come from the, the group I'd started with at, at learning on set. And I think that the magic of being on set is you just have like a group of people with like, you know, it's kind of like the A-team in a way, right? It's like you have all these people with these different skills and they're coming together for like maybe a few days, maybe a week, if it's like a feature film, like several months, but they're coming together to like make something as, you know, as amazing as they can. And, and really like the, the kind of collaboration um, that, and, and the way that they can like literally work together and move mountains. You know, I mean, even worked on sets where, you know, people literally did not speak the same language. Like, you know, like we had to work with the Korean crew, but yeah, through the language of film, and just everyone kind of knowing their job and their place, you're still able to kind of like, you know, come away with great work. Um, so seeing like that, um, you know, kind of work it, function, you know, really kind of, you know, inspired, I think, you know, the way that we wanted our company eventually to sort of exist as a culture. But I think you also kind of like learn, you know, the kind of the, some of the business lessons that are super important is that, you know, you're also working with lots of different companies. And so getting paid, getting paid promptly is like super important, uh, you know, to a freelancer, you know, you don't want to be chasing these companies, you're also doing a leap of faith in terms of like, you know, you know, are you going to get paid is, you know, is this company reputable. Um, so I think, you know, for us, you know, like learning, like, how important, like that little bit of, of uh, you know, important step was to make that kind of clear has been part of the ethos that we've brought into futuristic films. Also, I'd say like a level of respect, you kind of give everybody, um, we're forced to work in really close quarters. Again, with you know, people that maybe you, you've only, some people you've known for years, some people you maybe have met that, that, that morning. So you kind of learn how to work like, in a very respectful environment. Um, and, and, and also you kind of like, need that structure of, of everyone knows what their place is in terms of like they're part of the process and then has immense pride in, in, in doing that well. Um, and that's how film crews kind of like work you know, whether it's like a, you know, a small documentary crew or, or, you know, when you like look at the behind the scenes or the credits of a huge feature film. Um, and so like, like doing that. And again, it's, this is like day in, day out, like every week working with a slightly different team, you know, maybe even like, you know, traveling to, to different places or different countries. 
Um, and I, I think that the way that their film crews are able to come together so quickly and work so efficiently and, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, large, you know, amounts of, of, of money, you know, it have, have changed hands in the, in the way of, of, you know, of business. Um, I think that that was really, really good training for me, even though at that time I was just very focused on the film, learning the filmmaking like part of it. But, um, but the, the business part, I was just sort of like learning by osmosis. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit more about um, uh, you as, uh, you know, kind of CEO. Right? I mean, there are three partners. Um, how do you divide responsibilities? How have you as a, as, a, a, as a company come up with, you know, a philosophy on how you uh, build and um, sort of guide your future at Futuristic? I mean, what, what does that look like to you? I mean, these are questions you probably weren't thinking about in film school. No, not at all. And I think to just to kind of um, maybe just go back a little bit um, and then I'll, I'll, I think I'll get to that question. Um, sure. But um, like we, we started the company, I'd worked as a freelancer. I started to direct, right? Move from like being a, a cameraman um, to being a director. And I, at this point, like worked with, you know, very closely with, you know, all the, the top production companies in, in Denver, a couple in California and, and, you know, once or twice with like, you know, hundreds of companies. So I had like strong opinions of what I thought I wanted to do you know, from a business perspective. But I mean, the real reason that we started Futuristic or I became one of the partners was that I felt like I was looking around Denver and I, I didn't necessarily want it to move or be forced to move to the coasts. I felt like there was a, a great place to have a career here. I was getting lots of, of opportunities, but I didn't see necessarily like a, a business that would be suitable for me as a, as a creative person to kind of fit in. So I felt the need to start one. And, and we started that at the time with, with two other partners that I'd met working on a movie. Um, and we all had slightly different skills, but mine was sort of like knowing the commercial world and knowing how to shoot and direct like television commercials. So we started it really as a way of kind of like, you know, going from project to project, you know, sort of, you know, which isn't necessarily, it's, again, this is the beginning, not, not how we've evolved, but, you know, really kind of thinking of like those lessons of what we learned on set and being efficient and how we would sort of do, you know, one after the other. And so we were, in a way, it was very efficient and, and you know, good, but it was, again, it was very, very limited as well in terms of like, as we started to grow, we had to not only like take those, those I would say, ethos, those, those lessons that we learned, you know, from the set perspective from one project, but like learn over, um, you know, time, how to kind of make that into like a proper company and a, and a company that, you know, that, you, that doesn't rely on, you know, every partner being there all the time to get things done. And, and that's been the transition, I think, that's kind of gone from like, you know, being a casual observer of business and kind of like, you know, like appreciating the hustle to over, you know, was it 2007, you know, like 13, 14 years to now where like, you know, I'm not saying we've made it all the way, but like our focus is much more shift on like being like a fully functional business and like today you know i we have a a a shoot going on this very talented um um, woman elizabeth orn has come in to to shoot a commercial it's um it's like like you hopefully people won't be running in um by the end of of our lecture but they probably will um you know out at the kind of this farmhouse for one of our clients and you know from as a business perspective the fact that that's all happening without me there at all but i know it's going to be the quality i'm proud of I know that it's going to have like the feel of a futuristic production in terms of like, you know, those ideas of respect, um, you know, um, everyone's, you know, just um, it's going to be a fun set, all those things that we really care about and um, it, it are all happening. And I think that, you know, even just a few years ago, I would either be there or I'd have to direct it to, to kind of um, to feel that way. And right now, like, you know, this is maybe in the first, the first time that the last couple of years where, where you kind of feel like, okay, this is a real business where those things are happening and, um, and I, I don't need to babysit or micromanage. So it's, it's been a long evolution to get there. Um, and there's definitely been a lot of lessons that we've learned on the way. And I'd be happy, you know, people have you know, particular questions about that because it's definitely free to talk about the mistakes as well as the successes. But, um, but it has been an evolution from sort of, you know, thinking about it from like that project to project to project to, okay, now we're actually gonna run a business that, you know, projects end, but the business will kind of continue to go and, and kind of keep moving forward. 
Well, how do you get to that place where um, you don't ha- you don't have to be there uh, right. in order for the for the good work to happen? What is what is that mentorship process like? Because uh, you know, being in film myself, mentorship is very much a part of the filmmaking world. Um, it's very much a part of uh, entrepreneurship and, and business, right? Um, working with somebody who has who has maybe been in a place where you want to be. So, how have you built that into your company structure? I mean, I would I would say that from a, the the days on, on on set and the days that we are focusing on the film production, the mentorship is completely natural. That's something that, you know, very, very familiar with. I mean, I, you know, started out as an assistant to somebody and, you know, they were gracious with their knowledge. And as they moved up, I moved up and, 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 and likewise. And, and so I think having interns around the business, um, you know, here was a natural fit. And we've got like, I'm not joking, but, you know, one of the best things that's happened to us is a, as a couple of DU interns that have come and, and refused to leave. Um, and one in particular, um, you know, kind of came in, you know, with a business perspective and, um, and he was just fascinated. He wanted to work at a creative business and he had just finished his MBA program at, at, at DU and he kind of came in and he was like, no, I want to intern. And we're like, you have an MBA. And he's like, no, this is a company I, you know, I want to work at. And, uh, and I feel like I can offer you guys something. So of course we said yes. And, um, and luckily he's, um, he's still here. And, and now he's basically running the full operations of the, of the, of the company from a business perspective, you know, outside of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, you know, the, the projects and the creative part. Um, I, I think for part of our evolution is it, you know, allowed people like that to thrive by recognizing like what our personal limitations are, you know, in terms of like, you know, like you should keep me away from spreadsheets. You know, you should keep me away from, from, you know, making sure the check goes to the bank. You know, obviously I care deeply about that and it's not about shirking that responsibility, but it's just sort of like, you know, my skill set lies, how I can truly help this company is, is, is in different ways. And so, and, and for my partners as well, you know, like finding not only what you do well, but like, but like what you need, you know, what would be best to not do? Um, I think that some of the biggest mistakes we made early on in the company is, is that the classic startup, right? Is when everyone just tries to do everything it becomes integral to the, every part of the production. And you think you're doing it. Well, in some ways you are doing it because, you know, it's the lowest cost way to, to do things. But there's also a bit of, e- of ego tied up in that or a bit of, you know, maybe just panic or, but, but like the amount of things that, that we did for those first few years that we had to then like, like, extricate from our from our structure in terms of like you know if client pick up the phone you know they look for me and that's not necessarily the person they should be talking to they should be talking to a producer or a scheduler because i may be on set or i may be you know like um like doing other things or you know or i'm going to be unable to kind of like to put together a budget for them um but things like that you you kind of you you make i think um you know to, to go back again to a startup phase it would be like to literally to really identify where you want to be and how your structure wants to, to sit in five years. And, and even if you're wrong, there's still a target to go to and, um, and, and, but really actively go there, even if it means, you know, maybe spending a little bit more money or a bit, a bit more resource or giving up a little bit more of your company um, to, um, to, to people who are going to be a better fit for that moving forward. Um, I think that that super super important, and we have been really fortunate, particularly with this DU grad, you know, Mark um, Shelton, that that you know has come in and, and sort of like provided a place for us to sort of, you know, now you know now he essentially you know he, I think his title is, is like vice president, but essentially from a, a business standpoint, he's running the whole thing, and that's freed me up to 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 work on creative, uh, my partner Sarah Lyles to to oversee our production department, and my other partner Frank, who's one of the other directors. And it's, it's led us sort of like from the, that trifecta, just kind of grow into a company now where we represent, you know, I would say, you know, like seven or eight directors. Um, we have a full edit staff. We have a post producer um, to handle all of our editing. Like three full, full, full-time, you know, editors or assistant editors. Um, and then, you know, like a, another executive producer and, and a kind of a full-time production manager. Like the, the, we would have never been able to grow there without sort of someone taking on like the actual business projections, you know, all of those things. And so, you know, finding someone who actually really enjoys that. And I would say during the the last year, 
in particular when you know we're dealing with things like PPP and and you know needing to really like look at look ahead and and see where our overhead's going to be as opposed to you know me just like you know going oh yeah we're on set so we're we're busy or or you know things are are moving through you know was was I mean, at no time was it that more obviously important than that uh, but but having like that person really filling in the the gaps of things that you know I'm not the best at it, it's let me thrive at what I am good at and it's let the company just kind of grow beyond you know just sort of um, even the the skills of the, the of the partners. Now, you started your business in, during a pretty difficult time in 2007, during a recession. And now, um, you know, we're obviously in this um, new production environment um, caused by COVID, right? Um, what have you mentioned this idea of kind of uh, letting go and allowing people to specialize, but what have been some of the other kind of um, economic challenges that you've had to face in the last, you know, I guess 14 years or so. And, um, you know, feel free to talk about some of the mistakes uh, along the line too. And then how, how have you met those challenges? Uh, I mean, so we started the company in 2007, which was like, I, I don't know, in some ways it could be one of the, one of the worst times you know, to start a business, right? I mean, it, we came, as we were talking about the business, like every, the economy was riding high and then there was like a massive bubble and, um, you know, the, the economy crashed. Um, so budgets were, you know, were shrinking. Um, and at the same time too, and I think this is, again, you know, I think of this as being unique to film, but it's really in many businesses, like the technology behind film production was changing massively. Like we started out shooting film, like, like, you know, like literal film. And that was kind of like a level of quality everyone understood and, and where we wanted to be. And then, you know, the, the 5D, which is this, you know, digital still camera, which was, you know, just a couple thousand dollars came out. And that was like, you know, what people wanted to shoot on. Editing went from, um, you know, big studios to laptops. Um, so all of that was changing like that year. I, I think one of the, 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 the hardest things about that is that we kind of did, we definitely did miss like the, the big money, like champagne and oysters, kind of like, you know, stories that we always hear about, about big commercial sets. But I think it, 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 um, it, it sort of set us up to not only deal with like those change, but to really understand, you know, change in, in, in budgets and economics and technology was just going to happen throughout the life of the company. So, you know, we rolled with it then. But again, it's like we never really settled, you know, into like, this is how you make a film. These are the tools. It was always something that we we're like looking at, like, what's next? You know, do we need to invest in equipment? Do we need to rent equipment? Do we need to learn new techniques? You know, like, do we need to be able to not only make commercials at a very high level, at a high budget, but also be able to adapt with like the needs of like, you know, maybe a social media budget or the fact that you need, you know, like, you know, instead of like one main we'd say deliverable, but one main spot, you know, something that may, you know, spin into like, you know, 20 different like small social deliverables all around the same project. You know, all these things, you know, while they're, they're new, I think it just, it, it was, it was the behooved us to sort of, you know, be ready for anything and never really settle. I think there was a couple of times in our history where we kind of, kind of got into like what we thought was a groove in terms of tech and things working. And that was always a mistake because you're just like, you know, it, it is just, constantly a, a business about what's next um and and i think again you know i'm I, I feel like this is unique to film in some ways but it's really not you know it's really like all businesses are, are dealing with this the way that you know technology moves and and you know you know e economies change you know constantly um so i think i think having started in that time was beneficial i think honestly if we would have started like a, a year or two before that we would have been completely unprepared for 2007, how it folded, it rolled out. And lots of, of production companies, you know, even some of the most established production companies in the country went out of business during that time because they weren't, they were, you know, not able to kind of, you know, be that scrappy when they needed to be. And lucky for us, we were small enough that we were already, you know, scrappy and um, we were able to roll with it then. And, and I'm hoping that, you know, we're in a position where just because that's in our DNA that we're able to roll with it now. Uh, being yeah, being scrappy, pivoting right, pivoting is the yeah. is the word that it's I. It's a heard. new scrappy. Absolutely. Um, 
Uh, speaking of both of those, uh, we have a couple of questions from um, students and I'm going to call on uh, David Painter first. David um, is a student of mine. He runs the production club uh, at the University of Denver. So if, for those of you on the, uh, uh, on the call tonight, if you are interested in um, doing media production, uh, David's your guy. So uh, David, take it away. Make sure you um, unmute. Yeah, thanks, Sheila. Um, thanks for the shout out and the plug for the club. Uh, uh, and hi, Jasper. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm Good a junior you. at the University of Denver. I just had a question. You were talking a lot about um, like your experience on film sets and kind of like your, that like kind of being the Kickstarter into your career. And I was just curious, um, one, like probably what was your like most favorite film set you've been on? And then also like some of the like more higher I was just curious like the highest budget project you had yeah. so that's something you can talk about and if like that changed your experience at all um or if you like through the the company um the highest budget project you've produced too yeah no problem first I gotta shout out to your background I feel it's very like memento or uh it's it, it, it's sharp looking I like it um thank so, you yeah it's um so highest budget you know back you know when I was working sort of more of as an assistant as a cameraman i was working with lots of like you know national companies national directors so routinely we would be on sets where like you know via commercial would be like likely around a million dollars for for one commercial one campaign um and then you know i think the difference between like even though we've worked at, with with budgets that high at futuristic instead of it being like you know like a week of production of crazy production um it would be like for like, you know, that would be like for a full length, like documentary film where you'd be shooting like, you know, locations like all over the world. We did a, we did a documentary with um, Steelcase, which is like a kind of a big old school um, office furniture company where we kind of like, you know, it was literally traveled, you know, different cities all over the world to kind of meet with their people and tell different stories. And so, you know, that was over the course of many months and, and that was probably around a seven, $800,000 budget. Um, and I know these budgets probably sound like really like, like high, but, but, you know, it is, you know, when you have to sort of start, you know, paying for every piece of music or get a you know, composer to do it, um, you know, travel, a crew, um, cast, you know, wardrobe, all these things, you know, they sort of like what, when I came out of film school, I was like, man, for like $15,000, you could do it and make a movie. And, and, and in many ways you can. Um, but, but when you start needing to, you know, have like, you know, five options for wardrobe, um, you know, casting becomes a very, very specific process Like you know, the, the economics changes, changes quite a bit. Um, so I think those are the two questions. You had one question beforehand, right? And I, and I missed it. Can you just repeat that for me? Oh yeah. Um, just like, like your favorite, um, oh, favorite. Film set that you've worked on. Yeah. And it's a hard question because the, the best thing about film production in my mind is that every day is totally different. You know, like you literally often get like a map to go to work, like you get emailed a map. And when we go location scouting now, I'm, I'm in the pre pro as well. So like, you know, I get to go look at these places like first. Um, but, you know, it's like, you know, like a week or so ago, I was on a farm outside of Fort Collins. Um, and it's it's a job. It's really it's taken me around the world. So it, it, it it's hard to kind of say, um, you know, what my favorite is. But I'd say as like by one of my my as a young sort of up and coming filmmaker, you know, and again, before I was directing, I got to work on a set with a $6 million man, which you may not know, but, but I know everyone else in, in the, the older folks in the panel know who Lee that Majors. is. Steve Majors. Yeah, Lee Majors. Um, and the, the, the cameraman on that had, had just shot Pulp Fiction. Mm. Um, and, and so just like the fact that I got to be like next to, you know, him and, and watch those two people work, you know, was, was really cool and inspiring and, uh, and, you know, definitely got to work with, with lots of people that way. But, but, you know, it's not only taken to, to cool places, you know, obviously traveled to LA quite a bit um, in New York, but, but it's also taken me to like these random corners of the U S you know, like up and down the like Mississippi, um, the Mississippi river, like the, the there's like blues highway, you know, shooting down there. And I never thought that I would fall in love with Mississippi. Um, but, you know, we, we got to do a, um, a shoot, you know, kind of for um, University of Mississippi that sort of like introduced us to all these, you know, incredible um, blues artists and uh, and just just that kind of thing where you're like, I'd never in a million years plan on going here for vacation. But, um, but you know, I've just had this amazing experience with the people who live here. Um, and, you know, those are the things I think that you kind of, out of a film career, you, you may be, you know, 
get and kind of spoil you, you get to kind of work with that. And, you know, you, because you're working so closely with everyone, you make like friends fast. You can make a lifelong friend in a couple of days mm -hmm. um, just because of, of how closely you have to work with that, anybody. And I, I, I just, I think, you know, while we're talking about money um, and obviously this is a business class of, or, you know, entrepreneurship, should we, it's definitely money questions are definitely not off limits, but I, I see Kevin had one about, you know, yeah. about, you know, you know, how do we value our work, you know? Um, and I think, you know, one thing is, is that when we do budgets, they're not just pulled out of thin air. They're literally like extensive, like line items. And, and you have to go through them with your client. Like, you know, you know, you know, who do you want to be in your commercial, right? You, you see a lot of commercials where it's like the people who own the business and that's not just because they want to be on camera, but it's also because they're free. Um, but, you know, do you want it to be like you, you or your, or a friend or someone that, you know, like on the, the you know, like is, is the expense of that, like the most important thing? Or, or if you look at like an Apple commercial where they're like, you know, for this commercial, we want to, you know, have this amazing musician that represents our brand and stands out and makes a splash. And so you can see just even in the, the, the casting of a commercial, you can go from zero to like, you know, like negotiating a contract with a huge agent where you're, you know, you're literally spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, you know, I think that's, that's the kind of range that you're working with. And really like every decision that you have um, in a commercial from music, right? Like I, upstairs they're editing to this Fleetwood Mac song, um, um, which, you know, for it's, it's for a, a, a bank in the South. So it's just like a, a like three or four states buy but like that Fleetwood Mac song, you know, was in a couple hundred thousand dollars that was worth it to the agency to, to do that. But again, you know, you can have music that costs that's free. So every aspect you have like that wide range. And um, the, the one way I've kind of like thought to kind of make it sort of sane, it's like, it really is about like the media buy. If, if you're going to put, if you're going to spend, you know, half a million dollars, a million dollars, you know, in terms of paid media, and that could be on social you know, that can be, it's not, you know, it's, you all know, it's no accident what shows up in your Instagram feed or, um, you know, or, or on your YouTube and you're clicking on the YouTube link, um, but also on TV. But if, if you're as a business, as a company, one of our clients, or you're spending, you know, $500,000 to a million or more on, on the placement of this message, like, you know, how much do you want to spend on just making sure that it's just right? You know, and I think that, that, that while that's not, that's the upper end of the clients that we're working with, you know, that's, I think gives a better sense of like why it's important to sort of, you know, spend the money for a business on, on the messaging. And, and then, you know, at the other end of it where, you know, we have access to, to lots of social stuff where maybe the media buy is, is free or, you know, everyone wanted things to go viral, um, which meant basically, you know, lots of eyeballs for no money. Um, um, but, um, you know, so it, it, it can be like a lot less. But I, I do think that, you know, that's sort of like how we try to approach a budget. Um, and again, too, like if it's a project that we think is really cool for a really cool cause or something that from a creative standpoint that we want to do, we'll definitely like fight to do it, even if it's not going to be super profitable. But for the most part, as a business, you're looking for that balance. Yeah. Kevin, does that does answer that... your question, Kevin? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, kind of. I was more talking about like, um, skill based within your company. So, if, like, let's say you have a very good editor and like you have a very good post production team. How yeah. much do you consider that in the value when you're talking to um, possible clients? Like, how much are you like, hey, listen, this is what I can provide you. Like, we, I can guarantee you, like, we have the best post production team in Denver. How, how do you take that into account when negotiating and talking to clients? Yeah, I mean, okay, I think that, that's a really a, a good question. I think there's like several levels there and editorial is interesting because, um, you know, we have, it's it's something obviously that, you know, that it used to be that people would have to apprentice forever just to like learn how to do. And now it's something that, you know, most, you know, like kids know how to do on TikTok, right? You know, um, so like that sort of like barrier of, of entry is, is, is much different. And that used to be a way that like, sort of like those rates were set. Um, you know, so I would say that the biggest sort of the different factor is one, at the very lowest level, you're looking for someone who can, you know, do the project from a technology perspective, right? They can push the buttons and they can make the things come out and they can, you know, that all works. 
And then it's really like a level of going from like that as like a technician to being an artist. Um, you know, um, one of our editors, you know, we we're having to give it like a raise to today. Um, you know, he's moved kind of from being an assistant editor, which means like, you know, entry level, like, you know, like bringing things together, maybe showing edits to like a different editor and, and uh, before they, you know, getting advice and being kind of handled, you know, but as he's moved up and now he can kind of like not only put his own creative spin on that, but also work with clients and be, um, you know, able to articulate those visions and, and, uh, and, and people are going to come back, not just to work with an editor, but to work with, with him, um, you know, and, 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 uh, and so, you know, I think that that's sort of like as your rate increases, and then again, like you know, I'm I'm talking, you know, the same thing I'll say about acting talent or um, locations or or music. It's like you know, there's a level of editor that's just basically like you know, like a rock star, um, and and those people will command from five to ten thousand dollars a day, and um, and how you you sell them to a client is like your client is really wants to work with them, and we don't really typically work with people at that level. Um, because our clients aren't quite there, but, but, you know, there's those people absolutely and, and their reputation and their real, and perhaps even a little bit of, you know, in our business celebrity getting to work with, with someone like that, um, you know, I, I think is, 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 uh, is, is the draw. Um, so like our editors typically, you know, are kind of between like, um, 500 and a thousand dollars a day, um, for a client, you know, and, and so we kind of roll that in and, and, you know, get a little bit of a markup there. Um, but, but if we bring in a special editor for a project, um, they would probably, you know, someone that would be coming in to work on it would, would, with a reputation would probably be closer to $2,500 a day. And, um, assistant editors would be more like in like the, the 250 to, to, to 400 range. Okay. Yeah. Jasper, I mean, this is a storytelling business, right? And entrepreneurs need to repeatedly in Invent, create right that story that they tell about themselves so how would you address you know this group of aspiring entrepreneurs creatives um, on how to tell their own stories well i think i mean to be totally honest it's like i think most of you guys and and um and and, and, and ladies you know everyone in the chat who's like you know under the age of 40 i probably have a leg up on on all of us because i think you know the sort of social media the ability of sharing personal stories and video and, and imagery is just, you know, for the most part, it, or from my perspective, seems like second nature. You know, for me, um, even as a, like someone who, you know, makes a living telling stories, you know, um, professionally, um, you know, it's just not my nature to sort of like, you know, kind of, uh, you know, much more content being the guy behind the camera, the guy, you know, in the back of the edit room. Um, but I, I think it, the, the bottom line is, is that's becoming more and more important people our clients want to know our story they want to work with interesting people you know they want to work they they want to work you know um and and and, and tell stories from the production it's oftentimes like our clients like you know even the ones that are, are shooting lots of commercials um but um I, I i think you know we have to remember that it's going to be likely one of the coolest projects that they get to do right that year or, you know, is to go shoot a commercial. And so I think what we want to do is make that, you know, even from my, you know, you know, shyness on, on social media, um, we want to make that an adventure for them and acknowledge that and, and make it like a story that they can then tell, not just what we do as a final output, but also just like the way that we integrated them into the project and took them through this thing that, you know, that, that should be like one of the funnest things that they get to do. I mean, we get to do it all the time. So fortunate. Um, along the way though, it's like, you know, just absolutely, you know, needed to sort of, you know, get in into social media and, and also make like a more of a personality presence with our website. I would say it's, it's, it's even more complicated when that becomes a company story. Like my personal story, you know, starting, you know, how I did going through film school, the films I've made, the films I've been paid to make, the ones I've chosen to make, you know, like who I am as a person, it's like easy for me to express. But now it's the company is not just me, right? It's like, there's three partners, there's multiple directors, there's an edit staff, how do we kind of collectively tell that story? And, and we decided that, you know, with our latest website, you know, even like three years ago, maybe that we wanted to sort of like really get our branding to reflect that 
and it was a process we had to, you know, it's like they say, you know, the cobbler's kids have no shoes. It's definitely like we had neglected that for many years and it was an important part of moving forward. And we did enlist um, like a friend's design company that specializes in, in, um, in designing, but, but also really kind of, you know, kind of getting to the bottom of who you, we are as a business collectively. Um, and so, you know, that was something that, I mean, honestly, like it took about a year to kind of, um, to, to finish up. Um, but it was something that we all invested that much in and, and, uh, and, and we got to sort of like really realize that, you know, what made us different, I think the story of us all starting on set and kind of using the ethos that we learned from like the, you know, like, you know, being out in the field and bringing that into like a, into like a business sense, but, but kind of keeping that with us was an important part of our, of our identity. Um, we kind of were left with, I guess, you know, like a few kind of key phrases that we've started to use in our branding and even our swag and t-shirts. And, you know, one of them is, is chase the good story, um, which is like reflects kind of our documentary roots um, and something that just is sort of becomes an ethos, like in whether we're doing a commercial or a short form doc or something kind of more, you know, maybe personal. It's something that we, we believe in. Um, another one is the magic is in the making which is, you know, I think really sort of reflects like, you know, how much we enjoy what we do and how we want to sort of share that. And I think it's something we, we really do believe. Um, and then the other thing more succinct is films, we make them, which I feel like really kind of sums up like what we do. And, um, you know, I just, uh, I just, we, we have a new production van and I just uh, I saw a photo of it on set with, a, with that logo on the side. So hopefully that doesn't encourage any theft <laughs> but, but more is just like a, a statement. Um, but yeah, I would say, Sheila, I mean, that that's, was one of the biggest challenges and one of the things that I'm surprised at how challenging it was. Um, but but I really felt like it did help to kind of like work with a team that was able to kind of get us to, to really think about, you know, what made us unique as a, as a collective. And I, I do feel like if we would have thought of that sooner, it would have been easier. But we were sort of like looking back, you know, from almost like a little over 10 years into being the company and, you know, the ups and downs and all the people joining and, um, you know, um, and going like, oh yeah, like we needed to talk about like, what's our ethos. And I, I feel at the end of the day, it was like, we, we, we had one that we just didn't know how to articulate it. Did, um, did this outside company kind of take you through a particular process in order to, you know, figure out the story that you wanted to tell about yourself? I think they, I mean, yes. And I think, yes, particularly with, with the visuals and, and the logo that's on our site now is, is, you know, is a logo that's just like a year and a half old. And that kind of is based on, you know, I think, you know, even the name futuristic is kind of evocative of, you know, kind of like the, like old cameras and old technology, but like looking ahead, you know, I mean, that was the name that we, we came up with like organically, but we had to go like, you know, why did we pick that? Why are we, what are these things? So it helped to have an outsider, like kind of like leading that, you know, therapy or discussion. Um, but I think the biggest thing that, you know, just was committing to that time um, and, and really just going, yeah, this is something that's really important for us to move into the next stage of, of where we want to take our business. Um, we need to be able to articulate that in our um, collateral in, in our, in, you know, t-shirts and, you know, in our, our treatment decks. Um, we wanted to have that kind of like top to bottom and kind of like really kind of grow up that way. And, and, and I guess these are the things too, that, um, you know, starting out, you know, just coming from the film set and really just thinking like, I want, I need a company that can help me with my next directorial project. And maybe we're going to get some cool t-shirts. Um, you know, like that's where I started and now where we're at, you know, much more mature company, and, and really taking the time to go back and, and sort of make sure that our, um, that, you know, that, that these things that, you know, our pillars are, are sort of set in stone and able to be articulated. So uh, it, it looks like we have time for maybe one more question. So let me throw this out at you. Um, uh, you know, looking into the future, which <laughs> futuristic yeah. uh, does, right? I mean, I tell my students all the time, um, what you're training on today, it's going to change. Everything is going to change. And change is the, is the one constant that we all live with, whether we're an, we're an entrepreneur, whether we're a creative. Um, how do you sort of kind of capture that idea of change and, uh, and allow that to move you forward as opposed to 
hold you back? Like, oh, we're, you know, there's a new edit system or there's a, this, you know, right. how do you, what's, what does the mindset have to be of an entrepreneur in order to um, succeed in a world that's always sort of throwing curveballs at us? I mean, I think, you know, if I have like one, maybe an advantage or something that I maybe just even like, like lent on as a crutch is just, I absolutely like love it. Like I love visual storytelling. I love the way that we make it. I love, you know, sitting and edit. I love the, the output of it, right? And I do believe that, like, you know, even though technology will change, that the, the idea of, of, you know, being able to communicate an emotion, emotional message, whether that's for marketing or, or you know, for, for politics or for, you know, just, just a personal expression is always going to be a huge part of kind of, of the human experience. You know, whether it's, you know, people have always said movies are dying, TV is dying, you know, the web, it's, you know, six second videos, it's five second videos. I mean, for me, it's, 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 it's always going to be some form of that, but it always revolves around visual storytelling. And even as the tech has kind of like swung into, you know, at one point it was everything was going to be 3D and now it's like all VR or maybe it's going to be more interactive in terms of like game systems. I think that there's a the common thread that excites me in all of that is is this idea of, of being able to communicate, you know, visually, um, and um, and kind of get that out into the world. So kind of having a core that 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 you can say that you are excited by that or lo or like love that in whatever business you're doing, I think sort of like kind of no matter what technology you're using, you know, is always going to be there, right? I mean, I literally learned not that long ago how to edit on a flatbed where you're like cutting film and and uh you know i mean even then the teacher's like well this technology is you know basically going to be dumped you know next year and, and sure enough like it, you know it was funnily enough now it's kind of kind of cool again so people are digging it out but um but it, it the technology has changed constantly and um and but i think i just you know i'm excited by this change i think you've got to embrace the change and, and look for advantages in it you know i think with working with freelancers as we kind of, you know, we, we have a core of a company, but we still bring lots of, of, of freelancers and different people into different projects. You know, young people can have more of an idea, bring it like working with interns. It's like, yeah, we're mentoring them and we're providing an opportunity within this business. But like, you know, I want to know what they're excited about, what the technology is, you know, how they're consuming like this storytelling message. And I think too, it's, it also allows us, you know, why it's so important to have, you know, not, because it's a buzzword, but like a diverse group of people around you. But it is important just because, you know, it, you need those perspectives. As soon as it becomes like all one perspective, you're going to be outflanked in some way. So, you know, we can surround ourselves by, you know, people of all ages. It's like, you know, we, we really in, embrace, you know, sort of like youthful energy and, 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 and what's new at the same time, you know, like respecting experience and finding the balance between that. Um, it has been super, super important. So I, I think, yeah, I mean, if, if, if you're going to be in any business as an entrepreneur and you're afraid of change, that's going to be, be bad. I think the, the biggest thing I can say is like, is find something you really love or something that you can really, you feel that you can do differently or add, no matter what that is, if it's directing, if it's like running a business, if it's, you know, like a, like an idea on on whatever cryptocurrency is whatever it is if there's something that you that you are passionate about you know find you can find a way to wrap a business model around it uh, but you just have to be honest with what you are doing that's new and what you are what your strengths and weaknesses are and and also you know be make sure it's like a, a core value rather than you know like a piece of one piece of technology because the technology and the method are probably going to change but like those core values will probably not. Well, and it's clear that you have a passion and a love for what you do. And I, I appreciate you very much for sharing that with us today. I wanna to thank Joshua and the Entrepreneurship Program for this wonderful series, um, the opportunity to be a part of it. Um, let's um, uh, put those thumbs up, um, the claps, um, happy faces. Thank you, Jasper, for Perspective for having me. with us. Yeah. Yeah. And and I haven't given a, a, enough shout outs to, I, I gave a shout out to Mark from, from DU, but we've had several amazing interns from, from DU that have become, you know, the core of the company or moved on to do amazing things. So um, I, I do feel like when, 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 when Josh asked me to do this, I felt not only a, a debt to my old college friend, but also a debt to, to DU for providing us with such um, amazing people. 
and um, you know, in, in the case of a couple of them, people who are who are still at the core of, of our company. So yeah, thanks and, to you. Yeah, and, uh, and, thank you guys all. Yeah, and I I know some of those uh, former students of my own, and so thank you on behalf of uh, uh, the media, film, and journalism studies department. Absolutely. All well, right. You guys have a wonderful evening. Enjoy the sun while it lasts. Thanks everybody for showing thank up. You. Thank Bye, you, guys. Joshua. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua.